Hello, everybody, and welcome to Limited Level Ups. Today, we have got a Duskmorn sort of grab baggy ish episode on our hands. Um, I was planning this week's episode, trying to figure out what I wanted to focus on this week and what would be most helpful. And I didn't really come to a definitive answer. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I wanted to cover, so I'm going to just kind of toss it into one episode, a Duskmorn potpourri episode. Let's me just jump around to various topics. First, just my takes on the format, now that we're in week three. It's been a pretty big week for format development, uh, at least in the arena best of one Q world, because Quick Draft has now started, which means that a lot of players have migrated over there, and the players left in the best of one queues are generally going to be more cutthroat, you know, pretty in the know at this point we were definitely getting to the point where drafts are getting harder you're not getting past busted cards late it can just kind of be hard to draft a good two color deck sometimes so i want to touch on how i've adapted to that change as it's come up as a side note a little bit of a limited level ups meta thought for a second i've been thinking about my approach to how i cover formats week by week and generally i tend to have the most to say about a given format the first two weeks of the format right the discovery phase of the format we're all just kind of feeling out the cards and the archetypes and then past that i don't do too many like here's what this format is about right now big picture format at glance episodes for that format after those first two weeks unless i feel like there's a big thing right a really big shift or a bunch of decks that I, you know, I didn't feel like were very viable, but now are. I generally try to have those format-specific episodes um, be these big content bombs, right? Where you're like 40 or 50 minutes of here's information about this format that you know I, I haven't shared before. Here's like new takes. But I've been thinking about approaching things maybe a bit more of like a weekly update style. So more like here's been my experience with the format this week. Here are the tweaks. Here are the the nuance and subtle changes that uh, I've been experiencing. You know, focus on the small details a little bit more cards I might have come up on, cards I might have come down on, how I'm building decks a little bit differently. And that's certainly some of the stuff that I'm going to cover in today's episode. So let me know if you're interested in that sort of approach uh, for covering each format. Let me know if that kind of like weekly check-in on the format uh, is something that you're interested in, even maybe on episodes that aren't strictly about, you know, whatever the given format is. Maybe I do a little bit of a segment on a level up episode pertaining to the current format. But anyways, back to things we're going to be talking about on this episode. After we talk about some format thoughts, I want to talk about some rares. I've got a handful of rares that are maybe a little bit niche, maybe ones that need some build arounds. A lot of rares that are sort of in the middle, not the ones that are like, okay, this is a ley line or this is for constructed, but also not the ones that are like, yeah, this is a sicko bomb, you should take it. The ones in the middle of that do, I think, deserve some context, especially because, you know, in limited content in general, rares tend to take the backseat. So I thought I would shine a bit of a spotlight on them at this point in the format where most people have a good sense of the commons and uncommons. I think the rares do deserve a little bit of time, especially because there is an arena open, sealed arena open this weekend. So sometimes you're going to be making a lemonade out of lemons with some kind of oddball rares. So just once again, thought they deserved a little bit of time. Past that, there's some commons and uncommons I want to touch on. There's an oddball deck or two that I wanted to share that I thought were kind of interesting. And then because it is arena open sealed weekend, we are going to talk a little bit about sealed. Not a ton because I don't think this format is too much different than any other sealed format. And I've put a lot of content in the past out about my general approach to sealed. You can probably find that if you just search sealed on the limited level ups youtube channel or the podcast feed but i'll also try to link a few things in this episode's description if you do want something clickable something that's easy to find but also maybe we are just due for another sealed episode at this point especially in the play booster era so yeah let me know if you want that anyways yeah we will be covering a few sealed thoughts just to get those juices flowing that'll be towards the end of the episode but let's just jump in so starting with those format thoughts now that we're on Week three, again, like I mentioned in the intro, we're living in a bit of a, a different world now that quick draft has started and the queues just look a little bit different. And I think no matter where you draft, you know, I mentioned best of one, but I think best of three at your local game store, people are just more in the know, right? You're not getting bookworms seventh pick anymore. I mentioned last week that disturbing mirth, the black, red, and common has been going really, really late. And I don't feel that way anymore. I think it's now going about where it should go. I don't really see them late anymore. So people have adjusted. And this is the point of the format that your week one and week two strategies of how you're drafting you know maybe you're somebody who really like to uh, lean into blue white or red white you know some of the better decks or you're just like yeah black red is open every single time i can just force that that's not gonna happen anymore and i think if you're relying on that style of drafting of just really leaning into the good decks you're gonna encounter some problems if you're not willing to draft some of the weaker decks some of the weaker color pairs figure out what just the best course of action is draft in draft out on a case-by-case -case basis i think you should expect your final decks to just look weaker than they might have on previous weeks you're just not getting the super juiced versions of red white blue white you know those 
awesome decks. And also, I think as you're drafting, you should expect that packs are just going to get a little more dry earlier on in the draft. You might get to pack one, pick six, pick seven, not really have any great cards to choose from. Maybe there's one above average card and might not even be in your colors. And that's something that you should expect, right? Again, when you're drafting with more good players, people who know what's going on, that information gap has closed at this point. Rarely are you going to find that one truly very open lane where, you know, the, the runway signals are going and the draft's like, yep, this way, this way, come over here. It's going to be a lot more bobbing and weaving. It's going to be a lot more, I didn't end up my draft in the place that I started it. It's going to require you not to draft lazily when it comes down to it, to really try to figure out where you're supposed to be, how you're supposed to navigate into the best deck. So those are the circumstances we're working within. And the question, of course, becomes what do you actually do to adjust to this slightly new format? What are the actionable things that you can change in your drafting, your deck building? The big one for me, as I'd been playing this week and my win rate took a little bit of a, a dip as I was adjusting to, you know, just a slightly different format, is I realized that I was losing more games by being outcarded rather than being run over. And I don't even mean I was outcarded by like a blue-black control deck or just some blue deck with, with a bunch of card draw. I just mean I was being outvalued just slightly uh, against a wide variety of decks, even you know, against like a red-white deck that maybe had just a little more grind than I did, a few more rooms, a few more places to put their mana. And I think this makes sense given how I was drafting week one, week two, kind of just expecting to have a very streamlined deck where all 23 of my cards had a, had a place and you know, I wasn't really playing too much filler. Now that doesn't happen as much. And let's just say I was drafting a red, white aggro deck or a red, green delirium aggro deck. Like I mentioned, I found it increasingly more difficult to get good, awesome versions of those best decks. And because my decks aren't as streamlined, they don't have those awesome one, two, three curve outs as often as I might have a few weeks ago. That means that the games come down to a little bit more of a grind when you're playing, you know, a vanilla creature, a vanilla-ish creature on turn three rather than an awesome uncommon. It means it slows the game down a little bit on both sides when both players are doing that kind of thing. And it's a bit of a shift from being about tempo to being about value. That's kind of what happens when the power level of everybody's deck goes down on average. Games aren't as fast or half a tick slower, which means card advantage things or ways to spend your mana as the game goes on go up in value a little bit. And so yeah, I was just drafting kind of like I was on week one, week two, and like I said, had a bit of a, a dip to my win rate. And I had a bit of a light bulb moment with the card Derelict Addict slash Widow's Walk. This is the black common room. Derelict Addict being three mana, lose two life, draw two cards. In the first two weeks of the format, when my opponents cast this card, I was like, thank goodness, that's great. You did nothing to affect the board. You lost two life. You probably helped me in this situation, honestly. And then slowly, there was a certain point this week where I realized my opponents were casting this card and I went from going, oh great, to going like, oh no, they're going up two cards here. Am I, you know, somewhat aggressive deck it is not good enough at pressuring to really punish them for that two life. They're gonna be able to realize the value of those two cards that they drew. Again, the game's just being a little bit less about tempo, a little bit more about cards. And I think Derelict Addict, for what it's worth, I'm not trying to be like, oh, this card is awesome now, play it. But I have played it a little more often here and there, both because, again, I want to get a little more grind into my deck and because you just don't get 23 excellent plays anymore this is one that you get kind of late and I thought it was just kind of like an interesting example of how I've shifted my feelings in the format obviously the good card draw like glimmer burst that card I, I think is even better now this is the four mana draw two, make a one one glimmer enchantment token there's meat locker slash drown diner and I talked about this card last week as being a little bit overrated I had a lot of people in my comment section being like whoa like I love meat locker drown diner and they were going like oh I'm surprised you're so low on the card and uh, I think I probably oversold how much I quote unquote disliked the card I was just trying to say it was a little bit overrated because I, I had some people third picking fourth picking the card where I don't think you generally should do that but anyways yeah I think this card is okay I'm not a huge fan of it I think that Glimmer Burst is better, but this week I have been more inclined to include a card like Meat Locker or Drowned Diner, something that gives you a bit of card advantage, something that helps you in the late game. And of course your aggro decks, you know, they, they can't be spending all their mana drawing cards. There's just not that many card advantage things for your red-white right aggro decks, but the way you want to adjust for this when you're drafting a more aggressive deck is just include a few more cards that do something on turn five, on turn six, on turn seven, something that help your small creatures attack through a board stall. Last week I was talking up Glimmer Light and Conductive Machete, 
already. These two equipment. I'm even higher on these cards because these are the kind of cards that give your aggro deck a little bit of staying power, a little more oomph, a little more grind after your opponents removed your cheap threats were able to stabilize. Ticket Booth is another one that I've been slowly including in more and more decks, like two, three copies of this card sometimes. So this is the room that's three mana, Manifest Dread, and then Tunnel of Hate on the other side, four red, red, to unlock a room that says whenever you attack, her attacking creature gains double strike until end of turn. This is the exact kind of card I'm talking about, where your, your red-white aggro decks want this a little more often because you're not going to get eight, nine, two drops and a bunch of percussionists, a bunch of monkeys. You're going to need to build up the curve a little bit more. And what I would say is that you don't want to fall into the trap, especially in your aggro decks. You don't want to fall into the trap of thinking, okay, I'm red-white aggro. I have to keep the curve super, super low but a lot of the low curve cards that you're playing might not be very good. So to keep your curve low, to not play fours and fives, you might be playing some crappy threes, like the Escort. Two and a white, two four, then when it attacks, something gets plus one, plus oh, and indestructible. I don't think that card is very strong. Or the Cultist, right, the three mana, three three in white, that gains lifelink when you trigger Eerie. Same thing there. I don't think that card is very good in your aggro deck. So instead of playing those cards, to be like, oh, I gotta keep my curve super low. Instead, maybe the answer when you're drafting, you're like, hey, man, like my red-white aggro deck isn't coming together it's not play a bunch of bad cheap cards it's just start building up the curve a little more don't feel like you need to be red white aggro 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 maybe you're a little more red white aggressive mid-range you have a few rooms you have a lot of equipment i think it's really important as you're drafting to ask yourself is my deck coming together or do i have to shift a little more given the cards that i'm being presented i have a deck in front of me here that i think encompasses a lot of what i just talked about so this is our red white deck but i can't in good conscience call this red white aggro deck because if you look at the two drop slot i only have four two drops that can attack and block i've got two glimmer lights a ragged playmate and a hand that feeds i've also got a clocker percussionist in there point stands not a ton of cheap cards right i think you're really aiming for like seven or eight attacking and blocking two drops so really call yourself an aggro deck and this wasn't for lack of trying i wasn't like oh i'm just not gonna take cheap cards this draft started by me drafting a, a pretty solid looking aggro deck at the pack one a red aggro deck but then as the draft went on, I just wasn't seeing the cheap cards I needed. And it was something I was very conscious of. And I just went, okay, well, I, I clearly am fighting with other people trying to do the same thing here. So instead of trying to fight in that contested lane where they're, you know, I'm getting all the, the good cheap creatures, my fix for that is just to build up the curve a little bit more. I've got four four drops in here. I've got four five drops. I've got three ticket booths. You know, I was just talking about ticket booths, how it gives your deck's a little more grind. I went, okay, I'm not going to be winning the early game in this deck. I need a plan to compete in the late game. I need places to put my mana. Now, to be fair, this deck does have some really, really good fives. It has some reasons to go long. I've got Ghostly Dancers. I've got Razorkin Horde Caller, and I've got Dissection Tools. Like, these are all very good, expensive cards. Those cards, especially Dancers and Dissection Tool, would, in general, push me to, to build a little bigger on the curve, a little less uh, small card focused. But the main thing that had me build this deck a little bit differently was, again, just not seeing those two drops and noticing that in time in the draft. I started noticing that maybe around, you know, middle of pack two, end of pack two, and I just went like, I'm not there. I'm not at my my par of where I need to be for two drops, which is usually about, you know, four to three per pack. So I need to shift my approach to how I'm drafting this deck. So yeah, just in general, I think that everybody's decks are just a little bit scrappier on average. You're going to get curved out on a little bit less often. Like I mentioned, it, the games do come down to being about cards rather than being about tempo a little more often, a little more, right? We're talking about averages here. I'm not saying that we've had a massive shift in the format and the games look totally different. I, as always, we're talking averages here. We're talking small, subtle shifts, but I think meaningful ones too, ones that are changing how I'm drafting. So yeah, when everybody's deck is a little scrappier, a little more back to basics, fundamentals, a little bit less getting curved on, card draw, ways to spend your mana in the late game because games are a little bit slower. Um, that, that's a pretty good fix. But there's two other fixes that I have here that I've been implementing. Um, one of them is playing two cards in particular that I had not been playing too much in the first few weeks. And these are found footage and grab the prize. Found footage being single mana artifact that when it's in the battlefield, you can look at your opponent's face downs and then you can pay two, sack it, surveil two, draw a card and grab the prize. Like I mentioned a few minutes ago with that red white deck I had, I had a copy of this. This is one in red for a sorcery. As initial cost to cast it, you discard a card, you draw two cards. These are cards that I think you just didn't really have to include on week one and week two because you had 23 great cards once again. But I have found these as good includes in decks, especially ones that have some really good cards to dig to, but especially in decks where that 23rd or 22nd card 
just isn't that good. Instead of playing, you know, again, Hardened Escort. I hope there aren't a bunch of Hardened Escort uh, fans on this video. Hope this isn't going to become this week's Meat Locker. If there are, I'm so sorry. But Hardened Escort, the, the three mana two four that attacks, gives something indestructible plus one. That's a card I try not to play. So instead of playing that as my 23rd card, I'll play one of these filtering cards. The idea kind of being you just want to cut down on, on the junk in your deck and again, get to your better cards. When all your cards are good, the filtering is less necessary because you're just going to be drawing good cards. But I, I have liked a copy or two of these cards, especially found footage. I was talking about this card a little bit last week, but this is a card that I'll play, I think, in most of my slower decks, honestly, especially the ones that want Delirium. But even in non-Delirium decks, like I, I played this in a blue-white deck the other day. It was perfectly fine. Just dug me to my key pieces, my eerie synergy cards, my enchantments when I needed them, my payoffs when I needed them. Both these cards fall along the same lines of what I was talking about with like Derelict Addict, right? They're, they're kind of the same style of card, just, you know, implemented a little bit differently. And yeah, just been playing them a little bit more. But then the other fix, and this is something I mentioned last week, I anticipated splashing more often as this format went on, as any format goes on, um, that has relatively decent fixing. I tend to splash a little bit more just to make sure that the majority of the cards in my deck are good so I don't have to play a bunch of junk. So I've got a, once again, red-white deck, base red-white deck that is not an aggro deck. It's base red-whites, but it's splashing a Velvagoss Onslaught, an Omnivorous Flytrap, that's the rare 2-4 that if you have Delirium, put some counters on things, and also a Spine Seeker Centipede, and Spine Seeker Centipede, which, you know, in an ideal world, I think I only splashed the two rares here, but I was a little bit short on playables, and I was able to make this work because I had picked up a lot of fixing early in the draft. Sometimes, actively and early, you know, I took a Terramorphic Expanse pretty early in this draft, maybe around pick three, pick four or something, but also wheeling some lands and opportunistically taking an etched cornfield, which is the green-white land, over like a mid-tier playable in red-white that I, I maybe could have played if I was trying to build this as more of a red-white aggro deck, but just like that other red-white deck, as I was drafting this, I realized, uh-oh, I'm not seeing enough good cheap red and white cards. I probably need to pivot my strategy a little bit. And I am splashing fairly responsibly here. I've got two Terramorphic Expanses. I've got that Etched Cornfield. I've got a Valvagoss Slayer. Like, I'm not just throwing in a bunch of basic lands to splash these green cards. I'm only able to do this because I took that fixing early. And this is something that a lot of other content creators have said about this set. But just, you know, a lot of times when there's dual lands at common or pseudo common, speculate on those lands when you see them. Take Terramorphic Expanse relatively early out of a pack if there's nothing exciting. You'll open up so many more draft paths to yourself if you have the opportunity to splash one, maybe even two cards at this point in the format. And then just before we get into our next segment here, I do want to call it the Patreon, patreon.com slash limited level ups. That is the number one place that you can go. If you like what we're doing here, if you want to support the show, if you want to keep the lights on, really does help the show keep on going, patreon.com slash limited level ups. I want to give a huge shout out to everybody who joined this week. Saw a lot of support last week. So thank you so much for everybody who did sign up last week, who is continuing to support the podcast, the longtime patrons, of course. Now, yo, you're the real ones and really do appreciate it. A bunch of reward tiers over there if you want to go check it out. We offer a bunch of benefits if you do choose to support us. There's one, two, three, five, ten dollar tier. There's a bunch of customization, a bunch of flexibility as far as options go. So yeah, thank you so much. Back to the show. All right, let's talk about some rares now. Starting with a card that I mentioned last week, Cursed Recording. This is the two red red artifact that essentially doubles your spells when you tap it, but you only cast seven spells after casting this. After you cast your seventh, the recording deals 20 damage to you. So I mentioned last week that I'd seen some opponents doing some interesting things with it, mostly in control shells where they just had a lot of removal. But I had a red green Delirium aggro deck of all things that made really good use of this card that I wanted to share. So I think one of the key things that made it good in this deck is I have multiple instants and sorceries that make creatures. Manifest Dread being a big one, of course, so you can tap your cursed recording. Manifest Dread is two manifest. That's really good. Turn Inside Out, another example of that. One mana, make two two twos. You know, sometimes one mana deals six to the opponent's face that there was a lot of situations where I did that. Break Down the Door in these colors too, uh, in green. You know, that's the uh, the instant uncommon that other exiles an enchantment, exiles an artifact, or manifest dread i don't have that in this deck but just another example of a spell that creates a creature and that was kind of the core of, of what made it good in this deck i think just adding a lot of board presence after you cast a card that adds no board presence you have to you have to make up for that right it did help that i also had quite a few removal spells i had two beastie beatdowns i had a betrayer's bargain copying removal spell is still a pretty good thing to do i also had triple say its name and say its name being two mana draw two things out of the graveyard mill six like instant delirium when you cast say its name after cursed recording and i had 10 spells in this deck and i think it's about 
where you want to be but it's just a card that i wouldn't have expected to be good in this kind of shell and i think it might be like at its best in this kind of shell instead of a control shell because again you, you want to get the game over with you don't want to just have this thing sitting there being a ticking time bomb so you want proactive cards to pair with it and like i alluded to a second ago it set up a lot of combo kills i had where i, I had you know a wildfire wicker folk the uh two mana three two haste and red green that if you have delirium it has plus one plus one and trample and that plus even just like one turn inside out was so much damage and then another card that manifests dread that's uh it's a sorcery that would have been excellent in this deck excellent any deck to cast it under the skin that's the three mana green sorcery that manifests dread and then buy back a permanent from the graveyard put it in your hand with three say its names i'm gonna be seeing the cursed recording in this deck a lot of the time just like putting it into the graveyard and of course say its name only buys back a creature or a land so, so just having a card an instant or sorcery specifically being able to get the cursed recording out of the grave and then just under the skin being absurd to copy with cursed recording um that, that's a card i think that pairs extremely extremely well with it so yeah i wish i could have said this was a clean 7-0 it was a 6-0 into a 7-2 but but definitely above what i was expecting like i kind of played it as like not exactly a joke but more like oh it's kind of a fun card like you know we'll, we'll see if it does any work but i i legitimately think it, it was good in this shell like every time i drew it, I just felt like oh I can no longer lose this game like this this curse recording is just like easily gonna take over and I would say especially with sealed coming up this weekend a lot of people I'm sure are gonna be opening curse recordings being like ah damn it that's you know blank rare and a lot of sealed pools mind you it will be but keep an eye out I think there are some that uh, will be able to make good use of it fear of missing out this is one of my favorite cards in the set it might be my actual favorite card in the set at this point I just think it's a such a nice little tight package of a card. So this is the one in a red two three rare enchantment creature and it says when it enters discard a card then draw a card and then if you have delirium whenever it attacks for the first time each turn if there are four more card types you know delirium untap target creature after this phase there's an additional combat phase this card is quite strong uh number one a lot of times i have this card in the battlefield and just go is this lethal and then go yep yep this is a lethal attack but a few things i want to talk about with it I want to draw your attention to that first line of text there when fear of missing out enters discard a card then draw a card this is a specific templating. It's not if you discard a card, draw a card. It says discard a card, then draw a card, which means two things. One, it means that you are forced to. It's not a you may discard a card. When you cast this, you have to discard a card and then you'll draw a new card. But what it also means is that if you cast who you're missing out as your last card, you just straight up draw a card. The discard a card is not attached to the draw card. You can just play this top deck and no cards in hand, and I'll just draw you a card. And of course, you can sequence things where like it's one of the last cards in your hand and you cast as the last thing. So just a call out for people that might not be super familiar with this templating. But that delirium trigger, I want to talk about that quickly. So one thing that plays really well with a delirium trigger is vigilant creatures. Because what the delirium trigger says is untap target creature after this phase there's an additional combat phase well vigilant creatures something like spine seeker centipede when you have delirium that doesn't tap anyways so as long as it survives the first combat you're going to get a second attack with that vigilant creature and you can choose to untap something else right like untap your fear of missing out get, have that have an extra combat plus your spine seeker centipede i think it's pretty easy to uh, just look at the fear of missing out's ability as like oh only one thing gets an extra combat when that's not true another thing you really want most valuable slayer i think with fear of missing out most valuable slayer of course being the thing that gives something first strike and plus one when you attack because one of the problems one of the kind of little puzzles you're trying to solve with fear of missing out is just serve surviving the first combat right your creature being big enough to not just be like all right well i'll just trade first strike goes a really long way and of course with most valuable slayer you actually get two triggers you get two when i attack triggers which is kind of cool a few rare rooms with really expensive sides seven and eight mana sides so we've got three of them that i'm thinking of here uh one is funeral room slash awakening hall this is the black mythic funeral room being three mana enchantment whenever a creature you control dies each opponent loses a life you gain a life awakening hall eight mana when you unlock this door return all creature cards from your graveyard to the battlefield we've got restricted office where this is the blue white one one side is the field wipe the other side is lecture hall seven mana five blue blue other permanents you control have hexproof and mirror room which is the blue mythic three mana make a copy of a creature you control seven mana fractured realm if a triggered ability of a permanent you control triggers that ability triggers an additional time so all three of these cards varying degrees of playable i think funeral room is more for like a black red deck where you really care about that uh enchantment side the three mana enchantment side though i have seen it in like a control a black deck where you care more about the awakening hall side i think you have to really build your deck around that be able to get to eight mana to cast that card but you know point stands this is a playable card restricted office 
Usually you're just looking at this as the white field wipe side. And your room, the clone, yeah, it's playable. It's like a, it's a clone enchantment. Like you would play that sometimes. But the thing I want to bring up is that when these cards make their way into your deck, I'm actively looking for a copy of Keys to the House, which is the one mana artifact that uh, you can sack it, pay one, go get a land, but you can also pay three, sack it, tap it to lock or unlock target room you control. So just being able to unlock one of these super duper powerful rooms for only three mana, I mean, it's a pretty obvious synergy. It's something that when you looked at the set for the first time, you think about that, but I just wanted to bring it back into the picture because after, you know, we've gone through so many cards and archetypes and whatever playing this format, I think it might be easy to overlook. And I think just especially keys plus uh, Awakening Hall, that's just like a really, really good combo. Getting that reanimate all cards, um, from your graveyard ability, especially in like a black green deck that's filling its graveyard. Yeah, that, that is really powerful if you can get that off on turn five or something. Next up, I want to talk about the Jolly Balloon Man, one of the most fun cards in the set. So this is the three mana Boros card. It's a one for haste and you can pay one and tap it to make a copy of target creature, except it's a one one balloon. In addition to its other types, it has flying and haste and you sacrifice at the beginning of the next end set. So I think this card is overrated in the sense that I've seen a lot of people just throw this into a red-white aggro deck. It's not a very good red-white aggro card because it's a three mana, one power creature that pushes across, you know, a little more damage here and there. But I don't, I don't really think it's a card you, you tend to want to include in a red-white aggro deck. But I think it is a really cool build around for more of like a red-white mid-range deck. That's been the theme of uh, today's episode, red-white mid-range. You don't want to be copying like a two mana 2-2 two -two with a minor ability and just, you know, getting across an additional point or two. That, that's not really what you want to be doing. I think you really want to be copying things like Split Skin Doll, which is the two mana 2-1 two that when it enters, draw a card, then discard a card unless you uh, control a creature power two or less something like clockwork percussionist works kind of well it's the one mana one one haste and when it dies you exile the top card of your library and play until end of turn you know death triggers work pretty well with jolly balloon man too unsettling twins is the four mana two two that manifests dread fear of immobility it's the one that taps something down put a stun counter on it fear of burning alive in one of my coaching sessions yesterday we drafted jolly balloon man deck and we actually had two copies of them and yeah we just were not a red white aggro deck like sure we were attacking and blocking some amount of the time but uh, the real plan was to just get infinite value off of our good into the battlefield effect creatures. And one card that you're going to get for your Jolly Balloon Man decks nobody else really wants, but I think is quite good, is Living Phone. So this is the three mana 2-1 artifact creature that when it dies, lose the top five cards of your library, you can put a creature power two or less into your hand from those. So not only does this find the Jolly Balloon Man, but it also is a death trigger that finds all your other things. Like a lot of the things I just mentioned. Split Skin Doll, Percussionist, Unsettling Twins, you know, maybe other copies of Living Phone. Like, these are all small creatures. So just wanted to call that out. Like, it's a card that if you look on 17 lands, it's, its stats are not particularly good. I think it's uh, actually a below average win rate card. And that's because I think people are just throwing it into your aggro deck. Like I said, I think you just need to build around it. And it is a really powerful card if you do. Next up, I want to talk about Waltz of Rage. So this is the three red red sorcery at rare. Target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to each other creature. So it's a board wipe of sorts. And then until end of turn, whenever a creature you control dies, exile the top card of your library. You may play it until the end of your next turn. So really powerful card, but I think you need to be in green red to, to really make it work. You just want some big creatures, especially if you can make it so that, uh, you know, you have a reasonably large creature that kills all your opponent's stuff, but maybe it doesn't kill all your other things. That's kind of cool. I found in other decks, you just have, you know, your creatures are just a little bit too small. It's just like you have a 2-2 two -two and maybe you have a 3-3, three three, but they have 4-4s, four or you've got a 2-2, two two, they've got 2x3s, and it, it just doesn't do what you want it to do. So, red-green specifically, and part of it being good in red-green is the card Flesh Borrower. So, this is the 2-mana two 2-2 two two Death Touch, that whenever it attacks, another creature you control gains Death Touch until on a turn. Obviously, Death Touch plays well with Waltz of Rage, and it's one of the only Death Touch creatures in the set. And Flesh Borrower, by the way, a card I've been playing more and more of, especially as two drops and cheap cards are harder to come by. So yeah, you know, it's definitely a, a good include if your deck has Waltz of Rage in it. A cool two-card interaction with a uh, rare here, Reluctant Role Model. This is one in a white for a 2-2. Two -two. It's got Survival. If it's tapped on your second main, you either put a Flying, Lifelink, or plus one, plus one counter on it. But... It's also got another line of text that is relevant for the thing I'm going to talk about, which says whenever reluctant role model or another creature you control dies, if it had counters on it, put those counters on up to one target creature. And now it doesn't say target creature you control. So that means with patch plaything, which is the three mana four, three double strike that enters with two negative one, negative one counters. When your opponent kills that thing, you get to put two negative one, negative one counters on your opponent's stuff, which is just kind of cool. So if you got a reluctant role model, maybe just bump up patch plaything a little bit. Uh, as you're drafting. And one more rare I want to talk about here, a little two-card interaction, is Victor Velvagoth's Seneschal? 
Seneschal? Velvagoth's Seneschal. That is a mouthful. Anyways, this is the one black white 3 3 legendary creature that has the eerie trigger that says if you trigger it once, you surveil two, trigger it twice in the same turn, your opponent discards a card, trigger it three times, put a creature from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. And that's really, really hard. Often Victor is pretty underwhelming from what I've found. Usually it's just like surveilling two once in a while, maybe if you're lucky. You get to unlock a room in a turn and you get that second trigger, make your opponent discard a card. But there is a card in the set that for five mana is a single card eerie three times. And that is Grand Entryway slash Elegant Rotunda. Grand Entryway being the two mana room in white that enters and makes a 1-1 Glimmer token. So if you cast that, you get your first two eerie triggers, unlock Rotunda or play something else, some other enchantment, and you get the whole shebang. You get to make them discard a card, you get your surveil, and you get to reanimate a creature. And if you can do that with some consistency, Victor is actually a pretty strong card. I think really what is holding this card back is it is really difficult to trigger it multiple times in a turn. You gotta have a lot of really cheap enchantments, uh, but if you have two, three entryways, yeah, I think it's a legit card. But yeah, just wanted to shut that out because uh, Victor is another one of those cards where you open it in your sealed pool and you're like, ah, yeah, that was not that good, but uh, just look out for that grand entryway combo. It makes it a pretty worthwhile card. Rare done back to some lesser high rarity cards I want to talk about an uncommon that i've been playing more and more of seeing more and more combos just come together with it a card that like i was saying before as the games get a little grindier as they're a little bit less streamlined give you a little more breathing room for assembling engines i've been playing more and this is defiled crypt slash cadaver lab so this is the uncommon black room the four mana side says whenever one or more cards leaves your graveyard, create a 2-2 black horror enchantment creature token. This ability triggers only once per turn. That's the part uh, I really want to focus on. And the other side, Cadaver Lab, single black mana, when you unlock this return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So I see this as an engine card with a raised dead on top of it now. I kind of used to see it the opposite way around, where it's like, okay, you know, you Cadaver Lab, a good creature back, and maybe if the game goes really long, or you have five mana, you cast the crit first, get your creature back, you make a 2-2, maybe you'll make one more 2-2 throughout the course of the game. But now I'm really seeing this as like, okay, how can I make a 2-2 every turn? And there's a few ways to do it. One of them is Malevolent Chandelier. This is the six mana 4-4 four four that says put target card from a graveyard on the bottom of its owner's library. Actually, only as a sorcery, so that's a way to do it every turn. Gotta spend two mana. Gotta get the six mana card in play. But like I talked about last week, if you caught last week's episode, Chandelier is just a card that I've been playing a little more often in some of my slower decks just to prevent decking, especially in blue-green. Defiled Crypt is a card I've splashed in some slower blue-green decks once in a while if I think it needs a little bit more grind. Ghost Vacuum, this is the rare that uh, taps to exile target card from a graveyard. So just doing that for free. Like my opponent did this to me the other day. They were like a black green deck that filled up their graveyard with a few manifest dread cards and say its name. And then they played Crypt and played Vacuum and they were just making it two to every single turn. So that was just back breaking. I, I kind of, I was at 20 and I was just like, well, I don't think I can beat that. I, I conceded it at like 20 life or something like that. So that's, that's a really nice combo. Paranormal Analyst. This is one you might not think of, but this is one in a blue for a one three. Whenever you manifest dread, put a card you put into your graveyard this way into your hand. So, you know, all the Violet Crypt says is whenever one or more cards leaves your graveyard. So what happens with the Analyst is the card goes to your graveyard and then Analyst goes, all right, get that card out of your graveyard. So every time you manifest dread, you're going to make a 2-2 two -two with that combo. And then Fear of Infinity. This is the Demir Uncommon 2-2 two -two Flyer Lifelink that can't block. You're going to return it from your graveyard to your hand whenever you trigger Eerie. So just look out for these combos. Just, again, a way to give your decks a little more grind. You know, if you are playing a slower deck, that's what the, the lane wants you to draft. You, you know, red-white's not open, blue-white's not open. You have to be drafting something slower. You don't necessarily need a bomb for your late game to be sufficient enough. I mean, you'd like it, of course. Every, every control slower deck wants a bomb that it can rely on to grants inevitability but this is another way to do it right just like crypt kind of has is that stand in for like all right when the game goes long i'm gonna try to outvalue with this and uh, i've been pretty happy with it all right then just before we get to talking about some sealed i have a few cards in front of me that i've gotten questions from a few people this week uh, multiple times multiple people saying like how good is this card what do you think of this card just give you some thoughts so that's what i'm doing i'm gonna give you some thoughts on five cards i have here so first one is say its name this is the two mana mill three return a creature or land from your graveyard to your hand. And uh, this card, I, I was saying the praises of it on week one and week two. I think it's a card that's it's very easy to overlook, even though it's a pretty strong card. But I think it's actually a little bit overrated now. In the sense that I think people are 
putting it in every green deck. I don't think it's at its best in every green deck. This card to me is a delirium enabler. I want this in my green red decks. I want this in my black green decks. It doesn't specifically have to be a deck that cares about delirium, just a deck that cares about your graveyard. So you don't really want this. I think even in blue green, you don't really want it that bad. Like if you have to play it in your blue green deck, maybe you're a specifically a very bomb heavy deck. That's what I might want this card where I might not otherwise just being able to recur your bombs like that that is something I'm interested in but I wouldn't prioritize it very highly unless you really care about the graveyard like in a green white deck def definitely not the card you kind of want although I will say I have seen a delirium a green white delirium slash reanimator deck or two out there where you know they were filling their grave with say its name and then reanimating stuff with emerge from the cocoon the white reanimation spell so a little bit of an atypical deck going on there Point being, you gotta care about the grave to play Say Its Name. You don't really want to be spending mana uh, just to filter. I mean, it's a playable card. You know, I was talking about earlier, the filtering cards I'm happy to play to fill out your deck. I'm not trying to say, don't play this card. If it ends up in my pile, I'm most likely going to play a copy or two. Uh, this is more saying, don't prioritize it highly in the draft unless you really care about your graveyard. Fear of Imposters. What a weird one. So this is one blue-blue for a 3-2 flash enchantment creature. When it enters, counter target spell, its controller manifests dread. Yeah, this is one that I've just had such a hard time placing over the past, you know, week or two. Uh, I think this card is neither great nor bad. I, I think it is just like dead average, to be honest. So the way I see this card is it's flexible, but not that powerful. So you could have a 3-2 flash and just block your opponent's 3-drop. That's totally fine. Or their 2-drop or whatever. Um, you could counter their 3-drop on curve, so you get a 3-2, they manifest dread, you, you probably downgrade their 3-drop a little bit, and it's like, okay, like, that's that's about even, like, it wasn't a fantastic play, but, you know, you, you kept pace with the opponent, and then, you know, later on in the game, it is probably at its best when you're on turn 7, 8, 9, and you just have a counter spell that you can counter any really impactful card, but I think that averages out to be just, like, a little bit different than the common version of this uh twist reality which is the one that you can't target spell or manifest dread like it's not that much different and i think maybe on average a little bit worse to be honest so yeah not a card i i ever really prioritize but also just not what i'm sad about playing in my deck if i have ways to spend on my mana instant speed if i have things that care about enchantments yeah i'm gonna bump it up ever so slightly so so what's the takeaway here what's my final stamp uh, I guess it's that you, you shouldn't be afraid of putting this card in your deck, but you also shouldn't be thrilled, and I'm never taking it highly, and it's probably going to be like an 18th to 23rd card in my deck. I, I think that's where I land with it. Duskmorn's Domination. So this is the mind control. Four blue, blue for enchant creature aura. You control enchanted creature, and the enchanted creature gets negative three, negative O, and loses all abilities. So I would say this card is underrated at this point, because I see it. Last pick. Second last pick. Yes, it's way worse than a normal mind control. Losing all abilities, that sucks. Negative three, that sucks. But when it comes down to it, it does still kill a creature, leaves you behind something something, especially if you can steal a big green thing. Like, you know, one of the best things to steal is uh, the branch snapper, the six mana, seven, six trample, or just like any of the big land cyclers. Like, those are fine cards to steal. I would even say this is a slightly above average card, to be honest, in, in most blue decks. And just, again, it is going extremely late. I think people are completely off the card, at least some people. And if you're somebody who's like completely off it, I would just bump it up a little bit. It's, it's definitely a playable card. Actually, to compare it to the last card, Fear of Imposters, I'm pretty sure I like Dustmourne's Domination more. Let's play a game. This is the three and a black sorcery uncommon. Delirium, choose one, but if you have Delirium, you get to choose all the modes. And the modes are creatures of your opponent's control get negative one, negative one until end of turn. Each opponent discards two cards and each opponent loses three life and gains three life. Yeah, this is a good card. I, I really like this card. Every time I have this casted against me, I feel pretty bad about it. Um, you know, the times they like kill two things and make you discard two cards and drain you. It's a surprisingly effective card against an aggro deck because obviously the negative one, negative one, that, that kills cheap things. But often against an aggro opponent, getting their last two cards, whether it be a removal spell that they were about to use to get a big blocker out of the way, or, you know, they're holding the, their pump spells for, for that big attack all turn. Aggro decks often will hold a card or two in hand that they're, they're waiting for a key moment to use. But then that drain, really nice too. Just that little bit of life buffer. Um, I, I've been really impressed. The, the thing, of course, you just got to make sure you got Delirium. Because if you're ever choosing a mode on this, it's quite bad. But if you think your deck can enable Delirium by turn 4, by turn 5 pretty consistently, then, then yeah, I like the card a lot. And then lastly here, another card I like a lot. This is Dashing Bloodsucker. This is Tuna Black for a 2-5. It's got Eerie and the Eerie 
Fury trigger is it gets plus two plus O oh, and lifelink until on a turn. I guess maybe I don't like this a lot. I like it though. I, I think it is a quality card in my slower black decks, my blue black decks, my white black eerie decks. It always kind of feels like when your opponent triggers this twice and they attack for six lifelink, feels like that's a big turning point in the game often. Not even if you're an aggro deck, but I think if you're just like, you know, a, a typical mid-range deck and your opponent gets one attacking with the Bloodsucker after maybe it's blocked for a turn or two, um, I, I often feel like that, that's a pretty big swing in the game, pretty big pivotal moment. So yeah, I like the card, kind of like Let's Play a Game, actually. Uh, if you're not doing the Delirium thing with Let's Play a Game, you shouldn't play the card. If you're not going to trigger Eerie twice in a turn sometimes with the Bloodsucker, I don't think you should play this card. And then to close out here, yeah, a few thoughts on Sealed. So I've done a good amount of Sealed. Um, I've been preparing for uh, the big 100k event in Vegas, which is Dustmore and Sealed. So I I've got my reps in, and... I don't think this sealed format is too out of the ordinary. Um, there's some sealed formats that, that play pretty different from their draft formats, but this one I think is pretty close, as always, with sealed. I think you're looking for a, a good streamlined two-color deck. That's really what you hope to open. You know, your deck just looks like a draft deck, essentially. You've got a good curve, you've got enough removal, your bombs are in the right color, and if you've got that deck, great. Just submit your deck that looks like a good draft deck. You need to make sure that it is a good draft deck, though. It's not just a kind of like, okay, well, my red-white aggro deck with five two-drops, like, you don't want to play that kind of deck. That doesn't look like a draft deck to me, at least not a, a good functional one, right? And that's, that's one of the traps to avoid in CL generally, I would say, is, uh, you know, a lot of times when people don't open a bunch of bombs, their initial instinct is to be like, well, I should play an aggro deck. And uh, the way I think about it, is there's kind of this hierarchy of decks I would like to build or end up in in sealed. And at the top, it's like great aggro deck or or great uh, just like, you know, mid-range to control deck with a bunch of bombs. And again, when I say great aggro deck, I'm saying this looks like a draft deck. You've got a bunch of twos, you got a bunch of ones, you got ways to push damage. You, you can't just rely on being like, well, I'm going to play a two and sometimes my opponent won't play a two and I'll run them over. No, it has to actually be consistent. So yeah, that's at the top. That's the very top of the hierarchy. And then below that is like a, a good average mid-range deck that has some card draw, has some high quality cards, has some removal. Maybe not the bombiest of bombs, but like good enough bombs. Maybe you're splashing some of your more powerful cards, some rares that uh, were off color that you couldn't play in your main colors, but uh, you got, you had the fixing to, to shove in there. And then past that, below that, is bad aggro deck. Like, you don't want to be playing a bad aggro deck in CL. Again, that's a trap I see a lot of people falling into, being like, I don't have the sickest bomb pool in the world, so I need to default to aggro, I need to run them over. I think more often than not, your middle of the road, slightly above average mid-range deck with some good cards, you know, adhering to fundamentals, good good removal, good curve, all that kind of stuff, making sure you're respecting your man base, that's going to beat the crappy aggro decks. You know, you're going to have a pool, you're going to face pool sometimes, where, where people do have those awesome looking, draft looking aggro decks, and, and it can be easy to over index those and be like, oh, even the sealed format, you know, the sealed format's really fast. But I do think on average, your sealed pool is most likely going to be best built as just a deck that's trying to grind out resources, kind of like we talked about with Draft, where it's a little bit less tempo heavy, a little more card advantage heavy. I still want a good curve, and that's another trap to fall into, is just playing too many expensive things in sealed, right? But the number one thing that I'm always thinking when I'm building any deck in any sealed format is just how do I get the most good cards into my deck? And sometimes that, that means playing that aggro deck where all your good cards are aggro focused, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it means that you are splashing. Sometimes it means that you've got a little bit of a higher curve than you might like, but in CLD, you know, that's maybe a little bit more acceptable to get those good cards in. That's your number one priority, really. Just make sure as you submit your deck, you're like, this is what I'm going to submit. Look at your sideboard. Be like, how many great cards did I leave in my sideboard? Now, you're not going to be able to play every single one of your good cards, even through splashing. But I would just really go through, yeah, do that litmus test of just being like, how many good cards did I leave there? Is there three good rares in a color I didn't play? Not going to be typical, but, you know, I, I've looked through sealed pools sometimes where, where that's what, you know, the person has built a pool that doesn't include a lot of their best cards. So if you're unsure about that sealed pool build, that's the that's the number one check I do. How many good cards are on my board? And if there's a lot of them and uh, maybe about is equal or even more than the, the good cards that are in my deck, see if there's another build. One thing with this sealed format is that I've uh, I've experienced a lot of different builds, just tinkering around. Not necessarily uh, each pool 
having a you know multiple viable builds i'm not exactly saying that i'm more saying it takes me a little while to get to the right build because you have to sort with your mana base there's more playable cards in, in this set than you know some other sets might be and you often you're like wow i've got so many playables what, what am i supposed to do here i would really recommend building multiple decks multiple iterations of decks show it to a friend show it to somebody you know get a second set of eyes because i think it can be very easy to miss out on a build or just miss build by a few cards here or there. As I would say, more options means more opportunities to make a mistake. So if you do have uh, access to somebody that you might want to send over a uh, sealed pool to, I would really, really recommend it. And if you don't, just take some time. Just really, you know, this 24 hours for the arena open entry if this is the sealed event you're playing. So you got some time. Don't just be like, yep, here are the 23 playables I think look the best. I, I would really try out a few iterations, play around with things. Um, because you'd be surprised just like coming up with a slightly different deck and looking at it like I've had a lot of decks where I do do that thing where I look and I go huh you know like this looks pretty good just 23 pretty good cards good curve enough interaction all that stuff that I mentioned but then I'm like you know what I should probably do my due diligence here and look for some other builds and the second or third build I make is like oh no this is so much better it's filling in a hole that I the other deck had um, you know, maybe this deck offers me a little more interaction at the cost of my curve slightly, but I think that trade-off is generally worth it. I think another thing to think about is all the stuff we talked about, uh, about draft earlier today, where um, I, I would just really make sure that I'm including ways to spend mana as I go on. I'm really making sure that I've got card draw, making sure that the way I die isn't just flooding out. You gotta not play infinite card draw, because, you know, there's definitely some curve outs that uh, can still kill you. It's not just a glacially slow format. Sealed in general these days is like, a quarter of a turn, a half a turn slower than draft, I would say. It's something that is tangible, you feel it, but it's not something where you want to completely change how you build your decks. It's just something, just like I mentioned earlier, just like with the draft. It's something you want to tweak just a little bit, right? You're just turning a knob. Anyways, yeah, those are kind of the big picture thoughts I have on Sealed for this format. Uh, I wish I had some slightly more specific things to say, but Sealed is always a little bit tricky to, to talk about. Um, just, you know, when you're not looking at a Sealed pool and being like, oh, the specifics of this Sealed pool, you want to do this. I think I've covered the, the most broad overview stuff that I think will be helpful. If I get too specific, I end up talking about a bunch of stuff that, you know, doesn't matter for half the people's pools. But I do hope that if anybody's playing this weekend, you do well, you know, but let me know, comment uh, in the comments if you do end up making it today too, or even if you cash. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. I'll be playing myself, so uh, wish me luck as well. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks for listening and watching, everybody. We'll see you next time.